Hey, thanks for being a part of the conversation. Let's do some pod crashing. Episode number 329 is with Scott Weinberger from the podcast, Cold Blooded. Good morning, Scott. How are you doing today? Good. I thought you were talking about me, Rockstar. I mean, I was just... <laughs> You know, I'm more into glamping. That's me. That's me. I have a, I have a 28 foot RV, so therefore, you know, it's not really camping. When when the sun goes down, I go in and watch uh, Hulu. There you go. I'm with you. Great to talk to you, though. Well, I'm excited to talk with you because, I mean, you are, I, I, I swear that what you've got here is a good brain game, not only for you to go and do the investigating, but for we as listeners, we're trying to piece this all together as well. And you put our brains in places that take us out of this real world. Yeah, I mean, it is an interesting look inside uh, a case that really, in a sense, if it spans back almost 40 years to a different time, Arrow. I mean, you're talking about in the mid 80s where in South Florida it was more like Miami Vice meets Goodfellas and and trying to pick apart um, some of the investigation that was originally done and why so many people were afraid to come forward then. Now we've been fortunate enough that when we're locating these witnesses um, who have been involved and even members of of the Apollo Jim gang who may have been involved in, back then in some nefarious uh, criminal activity are now willing to talk. And it's really, it's really guiding us to a resolution, I believe, in this homicide investigation. That Jim, oh my God, that opened my eyes, making me wonder if my Jim is something like this, where the cops mm-hmm. and the crooks come together as one. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a place um, where... That was that was it. It wasn't like your local L.A. fitness or things that you would normally go to today. Um, it, you know, the air conditioning didn't work. Most of the equipment was broken. But these were serious, serious bodybuilders. Um, and then you could buy steroids right out of the bathroom there. And they were just getting bulked up. And the cops uh, there who were working out probably knew a lot more than they ever admitted to. And the criminals probably felt safer than they ever did because the cops were not moving in on them at the time. Wow. When you jumped into cold blooded, the podcast, you, you had to answer the questions yourself, who, what, where, why, and when I did. And I think I needed to have a general idea of, and cause it's normally when you look into a cold case, you don't want the previous investigators opinions. Right. You want to start formulating your own opinions. Um, it's like covering a case in in news. Um, you know, you could read articles about how other journalists covered it, but if you start looking into it, it may jade your opinion uh, about what how you want it to approach the case. It's the same with a cold case, fresh set of eyes, as they call it. You go in and start formulating your own, own opinions, and interestingly enough. We started formulating our own opinions early on in this investigation to determine that not necessarily anything was done wrong, but that they didn't have a lot to work with Mm. because nobody wanted to talk. There was no real one big interview back in the 80s that led them down the path that we've been led to. Uh, in the last two years. Yeah, but, I mean, the 1980s, I mean, I, I remember it vividly because, I mean, Florida was changing unbelievably fast. I mean, you had so many people coming into the country and leaving that state. I mean, it's like, who who had a relationship with anybody? Right. It was a tr- It's still definitely a transient state in a sense where people come down there, they spend time, and then they either settle there or they just move on to somewhere else. And, you know, there's a lot of different tentacles that happen in this case having to do with organized crime, having to do with cartels, having to do with members of law enforcement that um, were not not acting um, in a proud way for the the office that they held. Um, So it was a really interesting mixture with a backdrop backdrop of like sort of Miami Vice, as I mentioned, because there was a lot of uh, cocaine, a lot of marijuana, a lot of drugs fueling a lot of this behavior i mean even charlotte has its own darkest sides but i would never go walking into it how did you find the courage to go into this side of of the city because it man it was dark yeah i mean i I ultimately looking at it um on paper and just trying to determine who were the most important people to speak to yeah i mean listen the major you know the weight of the investigation is is on the police department you know detective danny smith in this case um is a 27 year veteran the miramar police department uh is a member of a swat team he is tactically uh perfect 
um, his his way into investigations is impressive. So I was along for the ride and just really seeing the way that he would unfold each aspect of it and then giving me the opportunity to really be embedded and capture some of the most, I think, incredible audio real time as you're knocking on doors and people are saying, um, it's about time you guys showed up. I mean, this has been forever. I thought Billy Hoppin, um, I thought you guys forgot about (laughs) <laughs> I, I can't imagine that experience when someone says, dude, I, I, I've been here for a long time. What, what, what's happening? Yeah. We're, and, and of course, you know, calling Billy's sister on the phone originally after we had spent about a month opening the investigation before we reached out to her just to see. We didn't want to make any promises that we hopefully couldn't you know, keep. So just the first phone call with her was so emotional. Yeah. And, you know, her parents had passed away, which is Billy's parents. Um, they didn't know who um, or what was going to ever happen with Billy. His reputation of just being at the Apollo gym was was tainted because all of these murders were happening. Five murders yeah. Yeah. within a span of a year. Mm. So what was Billy into? Was he part of some bad ring? Um, and, and thankfully, um, through Detective Smith's work, uh, I think his sister Lori now finally has some, some answers. See, I was going to ask you about the family, about did you have to negotiate a deal with them for them to come out and talk? But now now I've got a better understanding of how it was all laid out. Yeah, it really wasn't like um, approaching them, do you want to do a podcast? Better did an investigation to see what we had. Because it, it wasn't a podcast until it was a story. You're right. And it wasn't a story until it actually began, you know, you know, and I think I say I was so shocked. I, I, I've never been more shocked in any case I've ever covered in my career. It's a long time. Unfortunately, I, I admit that it's a long time um, as I am with this case because of the the surprise of how um, the expectations of maybe some uh, some investigations that should have happened that didn't happen. Maybe it's about some members of law enforcement that may have, um, I don't want to say look the other way because I don't have evidence of that. However, it, 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 we do know that some things occurred within this investigation that, that held it back. Some of it is related to science. It's clear. Science has changed over 37 years. Then sat in a locker um, that has uh, really, in a sense, it has never been tested. So that was my first real important ask to Detective Smith. Is there any forensic evidence that has never been tested that can be tested in this case? Because to me, that is one of the most important stories is what we can do today could not have been done 37 years ago. And that could potentially finally bring justice to the family of Billy Halpern. Scott, you know, you bring up a very interesting point there because you and I are old enough to know that DNA was not that big thing when we were growing up. We, right. we didn't know what the hell that was. And then all of a sudden now we're solving these crimes. And that's exactly what happened here. The DNA of the killer is exposed inside this podcast. It, it, it is. And, you know, I, I remember as a member of law enforcement, um, you know, uh, towards the end of my career. But to think that some work done by members of law enforcement back then, preserving, in a sense, gloving up correctly, preserving evidence, um, is solving cases, not just this case, but many of the cases that I do on my other show, Anatomy and Murder, are solved based on some of the really, really good work done by you know uh, the person on scene, the crime scene investigators, the electors of the technical crimes unit, that stuff making a difference. It's so easy to go to drugs and sex, but you're proving something differently here. Yeah, it's definitely something differently. And um, the motive um, is pretty shocking. Mm -hmm. Um, And and the aspect of how it developed is even more shocking, to be honest with you. So it it unfolds over the 10 episodes. And I I promise um, to anyone who's interested in diving in from episode one and, and, and making an investment. Because, you know, this is an investment of time. And I, and I, I think a, such a worthy investment because it's very rare that you get to hear this, not just being told by somebody. You actually witness it yourself because it unfolds, it, you know, and unfolds actually with audio, knocking on doors, talking to witnesses. And as we discover these new pieces of important evidence, 
you're discovering them along with us. What kind of tools did you use? Because I'm a Zoom guy and I also use Spreaker to get my sound. But don't you also have that fear <laughs> inside of you when it comes to when you're recording, you're going, oh, my God, somebody could come back and get me on this because I didn't tell them I was recording. No, uh, the the, you know, the police department records everything they do. Uh, okay. Technology today is is, is different, and it, it's it's normal for a homicide investigator to gather his evidence and not to shorthand, right? To be able to record what they needed. Um, I would always make my presence known. Uh, clearly, um, you know, I'm a journalist. And I'm responsible to, uh, to to handle certain things certain ways, and mm -hmm. and for things that I know that would end up being valuable, um, you know, I would cross my T's and dot my I's and do all those things. However, um, you know, the, this is not a sophisticated audio gathering system, but that's what makes it special, too. Because yeah. if it sounds too perfect, it doesn't really feel like it's perfect. It should not be the thing. It's, it's capturing something. It's sort of like, um, you know, when we walked on the moon, um, the video back then wasn't great. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't perfect. But just what you got was such an incredible perspective of what the astronauts felt as they stepped off that ladder. Um, this is, you know, everything is captured here in real time, and we want to preserve the authenticity mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. I always call that taking the listener someplace because I truly believe that. I mean, I, I had an interview one time with Dennis Quaid. He was washing his dishes. Didn't piss me off. I, I was sitting there going, this is awesome. You know, we're, we're washing yeah, dishes. I agree. You know, I mean, and, and that's, mm -hmm. that's what I love about. And, you know, that could be my attraction to this podcast when I get in the car and I've got to go to the next episode, the next episode. But the pro what am I going to do? Um, you're going to appreciate, I think, <laughs> the, the lengths that um, that a, a member of law enforcement um, it, it goes through to be able to take, you know, could be two and a half years of his career. Um, and even though he's working other cases, he's not just working specifically one case. But the journey to justice is not a straight line. Mm. Talking with Gil in, inside the prison, I mean, the, what was that like for you personally? Because, I mean, I mean, to me, you know, we see the Hollywood version of what prison is and, you know, Orange is the New Black. I mean, what, what did you experience? OK, so I wasn't actually at that interview based on my status um, in this investigation. Um, so uh, Detective Danny Smith went in with another detective um, to do that specific interview. Um, but I have done plenty of prison interviews um, as a journalist. And uh, I could tell you uh, in just listening to the beginning to the end of the recording that Detective Smith did, um, you know, and in talking to him when he was sitting in the parking lot, we were going over uh, some of the things that he wanted to talk about and some of the things that he felt was important. Um, you, you know, there's there's certainly there, you know, there's a nervousness no matter how many times yep. you've done it. Yep. You're not expecting you don't know if the person is going to come out, you know, because they have the right to refuse to talk to you, you know, not just the legal right, but they're, you know, they have the right to come in and say, I respectfully decline to, to talk. Um, so there wasn't really a, a, an idea of that eight hour drive it took to get to the prison from whether it would be eight long hours back because he, he wouldn't come out. Mm. Um, but uh, I was, I will say that Gil Fernandez was extremely respectful um, to detective Danny Smith, um, both being members of law enforcement, Gil obviously at one time. And, I do think there's a matter of of trying to read the room for both of them. Mm. When you put a show like this together, are you thinking about the receiver, the listener, only because I mean, I mean, really, in all honesty, when it comes to law enforcement, I, I this is one of those podcasts where I swear that that police officers need to be studying. Um, I, I did want to give that behind the curtain look. Um, so to speak, uh, of how and what it takes, to, you know, to take a cold case from 40 years ago and reopen it and start from from zero. Um, when I was when I was recording it originally, I did not think of that. Mm. It was once I gathered all the materials and laid it out like I would a cold case investigation on the table and started figuring out how I was going to tell this story is when I realized that the most important part of it. And I think you just mentioned what it when I appreciate that, which is is taking the listener audibly into the car, mm -hmm. opening the door, um, hearing the radio in the background, walking, knocking on the door, introducing himself, getting that first reaction from the person saying, Why are you why are you talking to me? Yeah. Am I in trouble? 
Why, why, why? I mean, that was 40 years ago. I don't remember anything. But then you then you sit down with them and you start to bring up names and show them pictures, right? And then when you do that, you look in their face, and this is what their perspective is. Unfortunately, you can't do it in podcasting, but you get a sense, and I think we do a good job in telling that portion of the story, is what the language that comes across in the room feels like. And we have all of that in real time, and I think we, you know, we do a good job in actually bringing the emotion of that connection and that first call or that first knock on the door in through the podcast. Yeah, you're definitely setting the standard here. You're, you're raising the bar when it comes to this kind of journalism because, I mean, you know, so many times in the past, you know, we relied on music in the background, dramatic music, and we relied on, on you know, you know, fake acting and things like that. But, I mean, you really bring the authenticity to, to a podcast like this. And, and I think that's what makes it kind of scary to listen to. Yeah. Um, listen, I, I think I always have a, a rule in music when it comes to um, to whether it's podcasting or television and the music should be um, supporting yes. um, the story um, and not become the story. Although in this case, we are in a journey that's 40 years old. So I do want you to feel what it was like back in the 80s, too. Yeah. yeah. So without, without it being too over the top. Um, I do think there's these turns that we make in transitions from your, our perspective of storytelling. Um, we'll, we're talking about an emotional uh, sister or the victim um, where she is realizing that all of these things are coming back full front for her. And, um, you know, it's a journey uh, musically that would be different than all of a sudden we found a new clue. And we've got an investigative cue in there just to take the listener on, because my hope is, and like with the other show, Anatomy of Murder, is like you're driving to work on your way and you, you end up sitting in the parking lot for a few extra minutes just so you can finish. And I've done my job, if that's true. God, 20 minutes with you is not enough. Dude, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. Happy to, happy to. Excellent. Well, you be brilliant today, okay, Scott? And thank you so much for doing Cold Blooded because, th once again, this, this is raising the bar when it comes to this kind of reporting. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You bet. You be brilliant today, okay, sir? Thank you.